Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone attending live today in all the different time zones and of course to all who will be watching the recording in future. My name is Janneke van der Weide and it is my great pleasure to attend and participate in the Anlister Research Summit for the third year in a row and to facilitate this session. Now, our aim in this session is to bridge academia, independent research and code breaking, and to discover the diverse efforts that all of us within the Analyster community put in to illuminate her life. And to do so, you see before you a wonderful panel with representatives from the various disciplines of independent and university affiliated research. And I will facilitate the conversation by asking some questions here and there. Now, should you have any questions for yourself, please do not hesitate to write them in the chat because we will leave some time for Q&A towards the end of this session. Now, first, maybe um, best to start with an introduction round of all these people. Very quickly for myself, I am very fortunate to be involved in the West Yorkshire Archives Service transcription projects, both as a transcriber and now in the second phase also as a checker. And I also did a little research into music um, of Anlister's life with, together with my friend Alison Kirchhaser. Now, I was triggered into doing so thanks to some of the wonderful researchers we know and love. Firstly, reading Helena Whitbread's Secret Diary of Miss Ann Lister and Ann Shoma, who spurred me on to do my own when I asked her whether she knew if there was anybody researching music in Anne's life. So, panelists, maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourselves and about your research work and what inspired you to start your work in the Ann Lister research community. I'm just picking the first person on the top for me, which is Diane. Maybe you can say a little bit about yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Diane Halford. I'm one of the founder members of In Search of Anne Walker, which is a collaborative effort to find out as much information about Anne Walker in the archives and various other places. Um, how I got into um, researching Anne Walker from a, absolutely nothing to do with history background at all, was um, two things. One, um, I went to York, as most people did when, you know, or have done, um, to look at Holy Trinity. Uh, and I saw the plaque on the wall and realised there was a bit of an inequality to me. I'm Lister in big letters. I'm Walker's right down at the bottom. I thought, partnership. She should be higher up. Why isn't she more known about her? So I started doing her family tree. I'd done some family tree work on my own family and taught it at adult education level. And I decided to... Um, uh, research a family tree um, and eventually I went to the National Archive to do some of my own family research and thought I'd look about a set of papers that I'd heard everybody talking about uh, down at the National Archives. I'd been reading ferociously, reading the um, Facebook groups and different researchers were coming up with documents found in archives. I'd never visited an archive before in my life. This was the first time. Um, and then I found something the name Broderick in a, in a piece of paper, which kind of linked all together with other people's research, meant that, you know, Anne Walker didn't actually come back with Anne Lister's body. And it just suddenly struck me, if, if that was wrong, what else could be wrong? So then I got kind of, and I loved being at the archive. <laughs> so then I kind of got the bug um, and, and I've been to many archives since. And we're just basically, you know, trying to find fragments of Anne Walker's life um, to, to build a bigger picture. So that's me. That's great. Yeah, thanks very much. Brilliant. And how about Sarah? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Wingrove. I'm a third year PhD candidate at the University of Surrey in the English Literature and Sociology departments. Um, I'm doing my PhD studying Anne Lister's travels in Britain and Ireland. Um, researching her motivations and her behaviours that we see in her personal documents. And I'm also considering that in relation to the travel behaviours of Lister enthusiasts today. So I think I first heard about Anne Lister. Um, so I run a LGBT book club in the town that I live in. And a book that got voted for was Anne Choma's um, biography of Lister. And we started reading that. And I got a bit like Diane said, I got the bug. I read that and then I started reading everything else about Anne Lister. And I was at the tail end of my master's degree, which was again, also like Diane, I wasn't a historian. I wasn't really doing historical work. I was a film studies student, um, but I was looking at lesbian spaces in history. 
And so when this PhD project came up that I'm now doing, um, I was already interested, so I decided to apply for it and I managed to get it. So <laughs> that's kind of what's brought me to this point. And I've just continued doing work in this area. Um, I'm a member of the Sex, Gender and Sexualities Research Centre at the University of Surrey. And I've also presented papers on this uh, at the Analyst Society meeting, uh, Lesbian Lives and Untold Tales. I think that's me. Wow, great. That's great. Thanks. Um, what about Jiang? Do you want to talk to us about yourself a bit? Of uh, course. Hello, everyone. I'm Zhang. I'm from China. I'm now in the final year of my PhD, so it's in the biology. Uh, so I'm the creator of the AL Index and, and also the code breaker since June 2020. So since early 2020, many code breakers, including myself, are posting the transcripts on various social platforms. And by the end of 2020, about 25% of the transcripts are already accessible online. So although uh, it would take many years for West Yorkshire Archive to re release their transcript volume by volume. There is it's all already a large corpus of the journal transcript that we can make use of. Um, but frequently, uh, the batches we code receive are quite uh, scattered. They, they can be uh, 18, 20 at this time and 20, 18, 30 and next time. So it's quite all, all, all over the place. So I want to find a way to navigate all those blocks so we can find a specific date um, uh, more easy. So the result is AL index. And also the keywords keyword search is also a need must. So I added that as soon as I decided how to work it out. And, and we're all very grateful, I must say, definitely me. It's a fantastic um, keyword search and, you know, changed my life in, in research. It was brilliant. So thanks very much, Jiang, and great that you're here. Um, Stephen, how about you? Uh, yes, I, I second the heartfelt gratitude that you've just expressed. Um, so I'm Stephen Turton. I'm a research fellow in English at the University of Cambridge, UK. And I specialize in the history of sexuality and the history of English dictionaries and how they intersect. Um, until three years ago, I knew very little about Lister, um, but I was writing a book about how sexuality is represented in English dictionaries, which will be out next year. And I happened to read Anna Clark's brilliant article from 1996 on Annister's construction of lesbian identity. And Anna sort of happened to mention that Lister had written a short glossary of sexual words that she'd found while reading various dictionaries. Um, and that really excited me because most of the books I look at uh, were written by men and they're frequently misogynistic and homophobic. And I really wanted more women's voices and more queer voices to balance those out. So I got a copy of Lister's glossary and I learned how to decode Cryptan and I wrote an article about it. Um, I thought it would be a one-off thing uh, and then I'd move on with my life. That was in 2020, and Lister has not left me alone since then. Uh, she's too interesting to stop working on, so here I still am. And it's brilliant to have you, Stephen. Great, thanks very much. And finally, maybe Livia. Hey, everybody. My name is Livia Labaki. I'm representing PAC with Potential, uh, which we started feels like a long, long time ago now. Um, I came to end Lister uh, through Gentleman Jack and found this community of people who are equally eager to consume every little bit of information available. And um, at the time, it seems absurd now, but at the time it was even hard to get a sense of like, what are the books that have been written on this topic? Uh, and so I just decided to make a list. And since there are so many different editions, I made a spreadsheet to see where you can find them and different publishers. And then um, I uh, reached out to Steph and Marlene and said, hey, can you just check this, see if there's anything missing? And that was our first spreadsheet. And then this site came about and this community came about and this event came about. Uh, and so this is where we are now. And so my focus has been less so on the core Lister research that you all do, but doing the infrastructure work, the support work, the community building work to help um, support that work um, and helping it thrive. So I'm very happy that we are where we are today. Um, and um, also excited that allows people to contribute in different ways, not only through research, but just supporting and reaching out and uh, helping uh, lower the entry point for anyone interested in these topics and making things accessible. So that's that's my focus here. 
Yeah, brilliant. I mean, just goes to show from it, just the, the five of you sitting here and, and, and myself, if I, you know, count myself along with you, the different um, aspects of researching and the different um, abilities and things that are needed and can help contribute to it to one each other's um, success in researching. I mean, I'm just thinking of all the trackers that, that you, you know, help create on the pack potential. I mean, brilliant. Just fantastic. So maybe just to start off um, the conversation, seeing as we have all these different um, types of research uh, gathered here in, in our meeting, maybe, um, Sarah, could you say something about how your work intersects or diverges with other researchers or scholars in this field? Absolutely. I mean, in utilising the primary resources, I mean, it's kind of part of the course of academia. I'm always drawing on other researchers' work to expand and enhance the arguments that I'm building. Um, but it's not just the analyses of other scholars. So yes, I'm referencing people like Stephen, like Carolyn Gonda, Chris Ralston, Anna Clark, and others. But I'm also, a lot of what I've been doing with my PhD particularly is drawing from resources produced by the independent research community, such as transcriptions and other analyses. Um, Sorry, I've got some notes. I'm just making sure I don't miss anything. So, I mean, as part of my research, I've been doing my own correspondence transcriptions um, for the most part. But some of this is journeys I look at are in like later, like I think it's like volume 14 in the journals, which haven't, they're not available on the West Yorkshire Archive Service yet. Um, but also the travel journals, they're really key for my work. And so I really rely on like these incredible blogs that have got all these, like the sharing of those transcriptions. And I think one of the big parts of that is like the time frame put for postgraduate studies, this sort of shrinks, shrinks that. So if I was spending as much as I would do doing all the transcriptions, I wouldn't have as much time to do the analysis that I'd like to produce the original analysis that I'm doing alongside sort of other like academic responsibilities like teaching conferences. So it makes it far more manageable um, to look at Lister's life in a broader sense with those resources. Does that answer the question? No, yeah, definitely. And I was wondering maybe, Diane, is, do you see it the other way around as an independent researcher? Do you also see like a merger or like how you can intersect with with academia? Oh, you need to unmute yourself. Obviously, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so we obviously use a lot of, um, in our research, we use a lot of pre-published um, things. Uh, we I, journal articles books that have been written um so yeah there is that 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 crossing um but but for us we're a bunch of independent researchers that come together and, and collaborate on just making sure that you know Anne Walker's story is told to the best of our ability and um touching on a little bit what Liv said earlier you know it, we try to make it as open as possible so the entry is open for people so we have people that have come to us who have got PhDs and, and, and are used to writing in academic fashion and, and researching, but we've also got people that come to us who just want to help behind the scenes and do things like um, websites um, or admin. And then the next thing you know, they're writing a, an in-search, uh, an in-depth research blog because it's contagious. When you're around it, it's contagious. So, so we're about trying to you know trying to incorporate everybody no matter what their skills levels are whether they've done research before or whether they've had a background in research um like myself I, I've never had a, a background in historical research at all and it was something that you know is just more of a passion so we just ask people to bring passion with them really whatever it is they want to do yeah great and, and, and could you maybe maybe Stephen? Could you say something? Are, are there any challenges of maybe these the, the the navigating this collaborative versus independent aspects of research? Also on the mute still. Do you think after doing this for several years, I would have learned? Um, so yeah, so academic writing, as Sarah will know very well, um, in the humanities in particular is often a very lonely task. We're usually working on our own in a study or a library. Um, but And that can be challenging because it is very isolating. Um, but what I've really appreciated about the collaborative space provided by the Research Summit and the Endless Society meetings in Halifax, Yorkshire, is that 
as I'm thinking about how to write about Lister, I get to listen to other people thinking about the same thing, but from a different angle. And that is so important uh, because Lister was, as we all know, interested in so many things and had irons in so many fires that there is no single person alive today who could explain everything going on in the diaries, let alone the letters and all the other documents. Um, you know, so Chris Ralston says in the introduction to Decoding and Lister that the diaries are a liminal archive which is to say that they're a threshold at which different research fields meet. Um, so we need institutional and independent researchers uh, and specialists in classical literature and property law and estate management and the histories of science and of politics and gender and sexuality, because everyone has something to bring to the table in order to place Lister's writing and life within a larger historical and cultural context, which we can all benefit from. Yeah, definitely. And, and Livia, can you say some more maybe also about about what, what might be challenges between the two worlds? Um, I think there are some challenges that maybe have changed uh, over the last few years since we started doing this work. Uh, so early on, it was a lot of uh, correcting um, misinformation uh, kind of thing. So what is reality versus TV show in terms of facts? Uh, so more just about accuracy and being able to uh, source information. Um, and that goes hand in hand with um, fact checking or resetting or setting the record straight on maybe some incorrect uh, information that had been shared even in published work. So I feel like that ha like has reached a baseline of understanding some of these things have been done very thoroughly. Um, though, you know, there's always new people joining the community and, you know, asking questions about uh, things that we at this point coming to the summit probably feel very familiar with. Um, but now they have ready resources available to correct those those issues that maybe they are not aware of. Um, I think another thing that has changed, and I think you really uh, the fact that we are here in the session is a testament to that is um, dismissal of non-academic work so all this independent research because it didn't exist right there was there was some researchers doing independent work but this explosion of work in the last few years really introduced a whole new set of not just people to the work but the dynamics of how the research is done and the level of collaboration that's happening um so i would say early on there was a there was to some extent a dismissal from an academic perspective, but you know, just unfamiliarity with like, what does it mean to work in this manner? So I think we've all learned from that process and I think we're in a different place now. I'm sure there's room for improvement still, but I would say that's definitely an area that you know I've seen really positive progress. Yeah, definitely, that's great. And, and, and talking of evolvement and of things uh, progressing, uh, maybe we can think a little bit about how maybe new resources can impact future research, um, especially as more transcribed work becomes available. I guess, Jiang, you're like the, the top person to, to answer this question, I think, with, with your skills. Do you see any um, room for improvements there? Uh, yeah, I think I might focus more on the resource development itself, um, particularly the potential feedback loop between the analyst community and the resource creators. So first is the institutional resources. I'm thinking of with Russia Archive and the uh, Ox Oxford University Press, which is said to will publish the uh, whole journal. Um, so, uh, and I guess producing a machine readable marked up uh, uh, file of the journal transcriptions, like an XML file will involve, will need to involve institutional uh, efforts. So what's, what can our NST community uh, have our say in this process? So I, I was wondering um, if we can have access to or be involved in some of the relatable uh, uh, decision makings uh, and bring our insights into this project. Like who, who will be involved in the further editing of the journal transcripts and like, like an annotating and such? And how will the working pipeline look like? and what standards shall they meet, and how can they be more useful and user-friendly to us. And then there are the non-institutional resources like uh, me and uh, Livia, Livia have created. So this could be more flexible and should be able to meet the diverse and constantly involving interests of enlisting suicides and researchers. 
Um, and there might be some people uh, in our community who feels that in order to tackle a question they have or to make res the research process easier, a new kind of resource should be created, but they only have a rough idea how it should look like, or they don't have the uh, technical skills to implement it. So to bring the ideas and technologies together, we might need some, need some platform that people can engage at any time, maybe an open whiteboard or something. So some people might throw their ideas in it, and some others might propose ways to polish it, and some might step in and say, I have the skills, or I know what kind of skills can be important to achieve this. So as yeah, more but... resources, uh, Livia. No, go ahead. Um, what I was oh. gonna say is that I, I completely agree. And I think one of the, the challenges there for a lot of people is like, we don't have any challenge imagining what we would like to do with some of yeah. the information, right? Like we have these wild ideas, um, but we may not be familiar with like techniques or approaches uh, that can help us get there. So uh, like what you're speaking in, in terms of like treating transcripts as data and uh, having different ways to manipulate data, not in the way that we have so far. Uh, it's probably very new to many people who have these crazy ideas and are doing really interesting research and could really benefit from that translation process of, of really using uh, the transcripts in a different way. So if you want to think about, for example, like visualizations of data, right? So, so far we've done a lot of these things very manually. Uh, even the, the fact, I know everyone really likes the trackers that we've had over the years. They're extremely helpful because they're a leap in terms of tool set from what we had before. But spreadsheets are like the lowest possible denominator in terms of how to structure data for this kind of investigation. So the next step beyond that is really treating the transcriptions and from all sources that we might have, including letters, et cetera, as data and be able to model data in new ways that we just not, not necessarily are able to do from like a manual standpoint. Uh, so the skills that Young is talking about, I think is pretty interesting to see, like now we're at the time, I've been like waiting for this for four years now, like when can we get into that? Uh, but I think working with the, the archives so that, you know, they can present that data in formats that are accessible for this purpose is, is a new frontier that I think we're going to have, like, exciting things coming along once we're able to do more of that. Well, I hear they're about somewhere, no? I mean, they're in this summit. So, uh, I mean, very exciting. Thanks, Jiang and, and Livia. This is great. I mean, that's, that's really cool stuff. I was wondering maybe just um, as... I wasn't always aware and maybe and and I still have some questions about um sort of the difference between independent research and academic um research. Maybe Sarah, you can tell us a little bit about what are some of the responsibilities that an institutional researcher has whilst incorporating the uh, non-affiliated and independent research. How does that work? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the first things that came to mind that comes to mind is that we need to point out the experts. Um, so like an example is when a review board is being put together for a journal, um, like say for example, like there's a special issue, it's the editors will be looking for people to review and it's not just going to the same group of people who are all institutionally affiliated, but it is our responsibility to actually sort of point out to, um, yeah, like editors and say like, well, I know this person and I know this person who isn't necessarily, they're an independent researcher, they're not necessarily affiliated with an institution. And it's just making others in the academic community aware because that's the thing is it is, sometimes it is literally that they're just not as aware, especially if they're not in the Anlister research community, if they're not based in it, they may not necessarily be as aware of who else is in the community. And I think it is our responsibility to say, well, I know this person, they know a lot about this particular aspect. And, ra and raising their names, raising their voices. Um, I think another thing that I certainly try to do is um, also like sharing academic conventions. I saw um, there was a, a note in the chat about academia not being very friendly. And I think it's also not very friendly for people who are coming into academia who don't know the conventions. Um, so things like formatting, um, like what what needs to be put into a document when you're sharing information um, like referencing styles because it's all going to be very different depending on where you are and I think it is that thing of sharing those academic conventions with community members to make sure yeah things like applying for conferences is made accessible 
Um, one of the things that I make sure that I do with my own research is it's diligence with citation. So naming, like one of the things that I do is the fact that I'm using, as I mentioned earlier, um, I'm using these transcriptions that are still on blogs. In my in my citations, I name the transcriber if I know who they are. Um, so saying like, I mean, when I do my own citations, I name myself. So why would I not do that for every other member of the community? I think it is also just within academia it's challenging the assumptions that Liv was talking about like the fact that there is this sort of there is still like resistance to independent research in certain institutions in certain departments and it is just actually having those conversations with other academics and saying like well no this is legitimate look at look at the way that the research is being produced like how do you know that independent research is trustworthy that's because there are there is engagement with primary sources, which actually a lot of academic researchers don't always engage with. Um, yeah, I do think it's more trustworthy to do that production with the engagement with the primary resources. Um, the only other thing that I was thinking about is things like making my work open access. And I know that Stephen does the same, like, well, we can, we make our work open access because it means that, I mean, particularly with some of the stuff that I do, I'm working with the community. Why would I produce research that I've, conducted with the community and then not make that available to the people that I'm talking about that just doesn't particularly seem very ethical and, and yeah. so Stephen how does how does that what how does that work um why would one not make something open access is there is like a, a reason from academia to do that well um so academic authors don't always have control over the license that our work is published under um, that's something that is determined by the publisher um, what sometimes happens is that the publisher does not make it available to you. Or there are other cases where a publisher will say, you know, you can make your research open access, but then you have to pay a very big fee because publishers obviously, uh, I mean, this is maybe a, a, a well-kept secret in academia, but we don't actually make any money from journal articles. All the money is made by the publishers, uh, you know, through subscriptions to the articles. Or if you, you know, you some, some journals will actually buy an, ind an individual article, but you have to pay quite a big, a big amount of money for that. Um, all of which is kept by the publishers. So if you as an author say to the publisher, I want this to be freely accessible, the publisher thinks I'm going to lose money. So they then ask you to pay a fee. And if you're lucky, you're at a university that has provision for that, um, that has money set aside for paying publishers. Um, because if you have to pay it out of your own pocket, it's 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 not really feasible. I mean, it's, we're talking, you know, sometimes something like, you know, hundreds of pounds or dollars. Um, so that's a bit of a, a challenge um, that we face. And something also to bear in mind is if you find a piece of work at academic writing that's not open access, it's probably not the author's fault, it's probably the publisher's fault. So just so you know where to send your complaints. Yeah, 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 no, my fault, yeah. No, understandable, that that doesn't make uh, an impact money. It makes the world go round, doesn't it? But maybe whilst I'm, I'm at you, Stephen, maybe I could ask you if like working with this larger enlisted community, has it influenced your approach to maybe future projects at all? Uh, it completely has. Um, you know, working with this community has taught me never to take other people's knowledge for granted especially outside of universities. I mean, so Sarah's just mentioned that there can sometimes be a suspicion in universities of research that's happening outside of universities. Um, and I think alongside that, there's often a sort of this, this sort of condescension. Um, so in the UK, at least, universities have a bit of a fixation with what they call public engagement, uh, which is when academics share their research findings um, with people who are not in academic institutions. Um, and I think there's still quite a patronizing idea um, among some academics that public engagement is a one directional process. Um, academics have this knowledge, which we then sort of impart to non-academics who are sort of presented as these passive consumers of that knowledge. Um, and that's never really the case, um, but it's especially not the case with Lister studies. Firstly, because institutional scholarship on Lister depends completely on work that has been done and is being done by independent researchers from Helena Whitbread onto the Codebreakers. Um, secondly, because a lot of people in this community know a lot more about Lister than academics do, certainly more than I do. Um, but at the same time, uh, the community is very polite and generous and helpful about sharing when we've overlooked something or when we've got something wrong. Um, as Sarah said, there's no competitive spirit in the community. It's all very collaborative and very welcoming, which is 
very refreshing because academia is not always like that. So it's something I'd like to take forward in other projects that I'm involved with. Yeah. Oh, that would be ideal, wouldn't it? And uh, maybe maybe Diane, because you're, you're definitely an example of that open access and sharing. Uh, have you got any experience to share with us about how maybe you have been involved with helping out academia with their research? Well, um, all of our stuff that we do is on our website. It's on our social media. We've had people approach us um, asking, um, you know, if we, they can use our um, our uh, articles and quotas and things like that. And obviously, we always want to do that. I think one of the things for me, though, is is trying to get the very slow drip through feed of the information that we find through to academia. Um so it's actually trying to get people to know about us and, um, you know, particularly for, for Anne Walker. Anne Walker has always been a bit of a side issue. She hasn't been as researched as Anne Lister. There's not as many Anne Walker academics, I would imagine, as, as Anne Lister. I do know some um, and they've and, and they've been wonderful. Um, so, so one of our things is how do we get our information that's open and free, primary resourced, well researched, how do we get that out into academia in a way that people um, can use? Because um, honestly, I've read some newer articles and some newer presentations that are still quoting things about Anne Walker from five to 10 years ago. Um, and things have changed. You know, we've got a whole group of people um, in search of Anne Walker and other independent researchers um, who are looking into Anne Walker and, and the landscape has changed for her and what we know about her has changed um and um and how do we get how do we get that uh, to slowly drip feed through to academia so that they can see that there's new and updated information done by independent researchers who are not necessarily attached to any educational establishment um but it's open open access research yeah anybody in the panel any ideas to how maybe to tackle this or what steps to take? Nobody really. I mean, I think having forums like this is really one of the best ways because uh, I think first it provides just visibility, right? Hey, I'm working on these things and you may become interested and start a conversation. I mean, that's really the, the sentiment behind the summit, uh, but um, uh, all the events we've seen uh, to date about Enlister research, I think that's that's a spirit that has been shared, uh, just bringing visibility into the work so that uh, people, you know, we don't have to have a debate about the merits of a kind of research, but just really focus on the content of the research and its usefulness and its applicability uh, and ability to uh, to be shared. So I feel like uh, for the most part, people have, have put their focus on the right place uh, in that sense. And I think events like this allow for more of that. Outside, of, I think the events are ideal in that sense. But outside of that, I think what Stephen was saying about like academics kind of pulling everyone into this, uh, into this frame of thinking and different approach to collaboration, I think you have leverage in terms of being able to influence future research in academia. Uh, with that. Uh, meanwhile, the folks who are working independently, um, I think, you know, not just the care that is put into the research, but the care put into making the research accessible, like Diane is talking about, like, and, and it can go into like really small ways, like make sure that the blog you're publishing is easy to index so that when people go on Google and they type the super niche topic that you're writing about, that you're actually going to show up, like things like that. And I think that an independent researcher can have more impact in that way by making themselves known and bringing themselves to these conversations. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Um, any, um, I'm actually looking with a slanted eye at my chat to see if we have um, some questions coming in already because I have not been looking at the chat at all. Um, and we've got like people doing stuff for us so I'm, I'm i'm sort of hoping that we'll have some um some general questions coming in because i think for now we have um oh okay yeah i think there was a a miscommunication between who was going to send them but um 
Yeah, I, I think all of us um, agree that the, the um, working together and the collaboration between the independent researchers and the acad academic researchers is is a good thing and uh, can only be beneficial for all. And and actually, I think, Jiang, at some point you mentioned something about um, AI future, future collaborations. I'm actually not sure if, Jiang, are you live? Yes. Or are you frozen? Because she was frozen a little while ago as well. I think that's the case, isn't it? Okay, let's just see what's going to come in on the on the questions. Um, in the meantime, right here's one. So the question is, and I can't quite see who who this was, but the question is: I know academics often need to keep things close to the vest in order to be the first person to publish on a particular topic. Um, Sarah and Stephen, how do you balance that wish to be the first to publish with the sharing of ideas that's happening in the Anlister research community? Who would like to answer that question? <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Um, I think it's one of those things about being fairly open about what it is that you're researching in the first place. Um, like, I, I think I'm fairly open with what I'm working on most of the time. And the fact that I'm often, yeah, collaborating with other people, sort of learning from what other, what other people are doing, um, that kind of gets shared anyway. And I mean, so earlier this year, well, still ongoing, um, I've been doing interviews with members of the broader international analyst community. I've been doing interviews um, and a big part of that, like part of the ethics process of doing that project was saying, when this is finished, all of this will be made available to the people who've taken part and it will be made publicly accessible through my university. Like that is that is also just a requirement at my university that any data that I produce from this has to be made publicly available. And I didn't want to be doing it any other way anyway. Um, I think in terms of, yeah, what we're doing like currently, I think it is just about, it is that balance because you do, like if you've got something that you're sort of like, oh, like it's not necessarily that the data itself isn't known because that's the thing is, I mean, the journals are becoming more and more openly accessible. Anyone can go and find that information, but it's sometimes the way that something is being analyzed or a perspective through which it's being analyzed. Um, there is, I mean, it kind of relates to what Stephen was saying earlier about publishing is that you do sometimes have to be a, a little bit selective about what you're sharing because as he was also saying, academia can be really um, competitive. Um, you don't necessarily want to be showing all your cards all the time. It's, I think it's about who you're sharing it with as well. Because I think if you're getting information from the independent community, I think it should be shared with that community um, in a fairly honest and open way. What do you think, Stephen? I mean, I think that's completely right. And I think particularly with Enlisted, because... <laughs> I think it, um, in, a, in a way, you can't hold your cards too close to your chest because if you mm. then come out and say something, think this is brand new, then somebody else could turn around and say, well, actually, you've overlooked this, this, and this. And if you'd yeah. actually shared your, <laughs> you'd have talked about yeah. it in advance, you would have, you'd just have egg on your face. Um, yes. But I would also <laughs> say, as much as we're sort of trashing academia, that the <laughs> academic community in analyst studies is, in my mm. experience, incredibly open and excited mm. and willing to share research and talk about ideas. And there is very little um, sort of territorialism. That's not the mm. case in all academic no. subjects. No. Um, but I think, and I think part of the reason it is like that is because of this growing community within and outside of academia where we are learning mm. from each other and we're learning better ways of doing things. Yeah, I think it's also, I mean, from the start of my PhD, this has just been how it is. Like it has always been collaborative. It's always been a conversation. And I think certainly one of the things I try to do is like, if I find a resource or something that isn't necessarily available to the independent community, I try and make it accessible where I can. Um, it is just, it's having that, it, I think, oh, I don't think how to word this. It's making sure that the route of information isn't just one way. Because I think that's, again, I don't think that's ethical. I don't think it should just be a, a case of just taking and rather than giving back. Um, yeah. 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 And and to be fair, I, I think um, the same um, 
keeping things close to your chest can also be said with some of the independent researchers who, who mm -hmm. you know, if you think you're on a scoop, obviously you do want to build it up a little bit and then release something new and exciting, don't you? Um, and, and I'm also sort of wondering if I should mention, you know, where is Anne in the in the Minster type of, you know, where, where there's a lot of we may have news, you know, coming up and that that's sort of also kept to the chests, isn't it? Um, question, if I may, for Pact of Potential. And so I guess Livia um, and also the academics um, it, who, who might know if, whether, and this is uh, from uh, Jane Kendall, is there any interaction between Pact of Potential and the Anne Lister Society? Do the two groups support and participate with each other? Uh, I probably am the worst person to answer this question because I haven't really been involved recently. Uh, but I, if you remember the first summit, uh, Laurie came and uh, was on our session talking about the future. Um, and I think we've seen cross pollination between the two events as well. So that definitely has been been true over the years. I don't know if there's anything specific happening or happening uh, recently, but uh, I'm no. sure we can go up on that. Yeah. And also, I think... Um... Um, the um, what Jiang was talking about a little bit earlier is so exciting, and what with the um, the Oxford um, um, University Press um, going to publish this, and how how the lead the way up leading up to it, and I know Laura Shannon is involved with that as well with the West Yorkshire Archive. So, I guess um, yeah, let's all work together, um, and I'm sure that they will. A question from Felicity Carnell or Carnell, I'm not sure. What advice would the panel give to someone researching how typical of a lady woman in the 18th century and early 19th century Anne Lister was? So what advice would you give to someone researching how typical of a lady woman Anne Lister was? I think my Somebody... first, sorry, I was just going to say, I think my first port of call would be to looking at other accounts obviously we know like listers is probably one of the biggest that you're going to come across in terms of like like content um but i think it is just making sure that you're not um what's the word sort of like pedestaling her or sort of like automatically seeing her as like so different it is like making sure that you are looking at other accounts from women of the time seeing how they're talking about themselves because it like there may not be as significant accounts but they are still there and it's just looking at the way that they're talking about themselves their lives their families sorry <coughs> um it is just looking to see and I think it depends on what aspect of Lister's life that you're looking at in that relation so like, for example, so one of the things that I do is I'm looking at Lister's travel and her travel motivations. And that is something that I'm interested in. It's like, well, how abnormal is it that she's going to like all these spa towns in her like before she starts going abroad? Like, how common is that? It's really common. It's really common. Um, so it's just kind of it's comparing her to her peers at the time, which is another. Sorry. <laughs> great yes. reason for resources like this because we do start to hear the stories of these other women that she knew yeah and it also sh sort of um shows that that she obviously she is embedded in a larger history around her like the whole it, it would just be if you wanted to look into how typical of a lady woman she was you really should also go into well what what were women like in that time you know you need to sort of do an in-depth research into well where did she differ like what was the norm i guess no which brings with it an enormous enormously large research into history um yes i think i think important for any kind of research to do with Anne walker or Anne lister is 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 context social context of the time you know we say we can say things like this happened because but unless we've got you know a concept of social history at the time it can be out of place, um, you know, when we talk about um, Anne Lister's, uh, Anne, I'm sorry, Anne Walker's Lunacy Commission, for example, um, we could have debates, we weren't there, we don't know what happened beforehand, but, you know, 
was what she was doing in line with what was expected at the time and if not it might not be against our social norms now but you know you've got to kind of weigh things um based on the contextual social history at the time yeah well quite um Right. I mean, I think I might ask everyone if there is anything um, for you maybe to have like a, a parting um, observation, because the, the questions have dried up. And um, and I think we've had a really interesting conversation here. Um, and and it, it is also OK to just, you know, come to a close naturally like this. But maybe we want to have um, uh, just one more round of you know what? What do you what are you really looking forward to in in the near future? Maybe something that you are working on, or what you would like to be working on in the near future. Um, uh, Jiang. Uh, I think uh, some work might need to be done uh, at the more meta level, like. If you read some sentence in the journal, uh, you might not know some, there's something interesting behind it, or you need uh, other context outside this journal entry to know, uh, to make sense of it. So how can we help casual journal readers to make sense of what they read and make the large corpus of any star archive to be more engaging, thought provoking, so we can stimulate more questions and increase the probability of a casual journal reader to turn into uh, an interesting researcher like many code workers have, have done. So that, that's what I'm looking for. Oh, that's great. And it's true, the, the context behind all the, the, the details in a diary are so big, sometimes you just don't know where to go. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant idea. And and do you, do you sort of foresee an, a solution for this? Is this something that you've been thinking about or? Well, well, not exact solution, just some rough ideas. So yeah, we need to discuss and collaborate. No, great. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing a collaboration on this. On this, definitely great. Um, that's that's an interesting thing to think about because if you just ask the people in this room here, uh, like all the participants in this session, 72 people, uh, we probably would see such a different trajectory for like how you came to Enlister, what were the first things you read? What did you get excited about and then started to investigate? So no one ever really starts from the same kind of like base knowledge. Uh, so like, you know, the wave of people that came to Enlister from the TV show had that as the base knowledge. And so they had to like diverge from that as they got into doing the research. So is there something like an Enlister primer that uh, allows new people to just get situated? Like these Catch are up. the four things you need to kind of get your head around. Uh, and maybe here's some like paths that people tend to go down on. Um, that, you know, that is definitely something that we can weave together just from our collective understanding and experiences, um, uh, whether that's like manual labor to do, or we use technologies to support us doing that. Uh, that's a different conversation, I think exciting one to have. But um, I think we have now after, you know, four years of growing research, amass so much information, it can be very overwhelming if you're new. Um, like, you know, when we started this, you know, the what, how much we knew about Ann Walker was like minimal. And like today, uh, the the Ann Walker group has done so much that you it could be overwhelming to to even like try to get your head around it. So I think because we now have uncovered so much it can be actually harder as an entry point. So I think it, it behooves us to to start or creating tools or access points that are maybe simpler. And then we forget, right? How did we get here? Uh, how can we reintroduce and blister maybe to a broader audience uh, with like easier paths into the research or into the resources that are available? So I, I, I'd be curious to see how we might develop something like that. Well, I, I, I feel a very good collaboration going on there already, like, you know, food for thought. Um, uh, Diane, w w is there anything that you're particularly working on right now or wanting to delve into? Well, what we've done is we've amassed, and amassed a, a large amount of primary resources. 
and uh, and that's been kind of an ongoing project that we've been doing through various you know um, bits and pieces that we've been doing archives online research various other bits and pieces and so what what we're planning on doing is putting that um you know starting to filter through that and finding things that we can write more about putting it in context um filling in those jigsaw piece puzzles of Anne's life that's uh, that's missing and a, part, a good part of that is you know um transcribing documents so we can get the most out of what's what's in a letter um I'll be talking tomorrow about we've found a letter that's not really related to anybody but it's got a real nugget of information in there about Anne's life and you know it's just um things like that so we're just basically going through our, our resources at the moment and and trying to put things together so that again like everything said you know well resourced uh, well researched you know um open access and and also writing in an open style as well which i think is really important so that people that come wherever they're coming from in their level exactly as you've just been speaking about wherever they come from about their knowledge of Anne Lister or Anne Walker they can pick it up and read it and, and understand it without having to know tons of background um, in order to put it into place. Yeah, very good point. Yeah, great. Stephen, you are parting. Well, I think it would be really remiss of me if I didn't say that I'm looking forward to the next meeting of the Analyst of Society in Halifax uh, next year. And in the spirit of collaboration that we've all been talking about, I mean, if anyone here is working on something that they would like to share at the society you'd be heartily welcome to submit an abstract um to laurie shannon abstracts flows on the 25th of october so there is still time and for anyone who hasn't been to the society before it, it is an in-person event um it features academics it features independent researchers it features a, a whole host of people i mean all that's already required is that you bring a passion for and list it with you uh, yeah, and I can you know attest to that that you know there's a, a room full of very passionate people there. I mean, they have been the last couple of years. I've I've loved going, and it now is my main draw of going in that April is for LS definitely. Um, Sarah, one last parting shot. Yeah, sure. I mean, ditto with Stephen. Absolutely, LS next year. Um, I think, I mean, for me right now, it's just starting to, I've been doing all these interviews with the community. It has been a bit of a roller coaster of a summer doing all that, like all those engagements is wonderful. Um, and it's just starting to do the analysis and actually start to bring it into papers. One of those being the one that I'm hopefully going to present next year at ALS, hopefully. Um, but yeah, it's, it's doing that analysis, doing that work, and then just getting to show it back with the community that I'm researching. That's great. Well, I'm really looking forward to the other sessions this year in the um, in Analyst Research Summit that we're in right now. So I guess we'll just um, say goodbye, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you, panel, for your expertise. And um, I've had a really lovely hour. And um, well, we'll see you in, in some collaboration some other time. OK, bye bye. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Thank you.